After forcing Emmanuel Spiteri to give him his cash card and PIN number, Ireland strangled him to death with a rope. This time, the 39-year-old killer tried a new way to hide the evidence. There'd been an attempt to burn the flat. Die. The furniture had been piled up. He'd clearly set fire to it. Oxygen had run out, and that's why it went out. And very, very fortunately, because it was a top-floor flat, and he could easily have killed people below and, and to the side of it. We know that he's done a lot of reading around cases of serial murder. He's probably got an awareness that fire is one of the few things that will destroy DNA. So I think what's going on here is that he's trying to destroy the evidence that, that links him to the scene. But at the same time, he wants recognition for the crime as well. What he was doing was creating another murder, creating another scene, and, and trying to get recognition, but still maintain that anonymity. Luckily, the fire island had started had gone out and the flat didn't burn down. Three days later, on the 15th of June, Emmanuel Spiteri's landlady found her lodger dead and called the police. They retraced Emmanuel Spiteri's last steps and for the first time got a look at the killer's face. Fortunately, he was captured on CCTV uh, at Charing Cross Station, so we've got Emmanuel, five foot two, in front of uh, Colin Ireland, six foot one, on a single shot just coming out of the tube station. Not very clear of the head, but you can see the build and the height, uh, and clearly you've got Emmanuel in front of him. So that was a crucial piece of evidence. Although, obviously, it was not a piece of evidence which would necessarily confirm that he was the killer, but it was, a, it was that kind of circumstantial evidence on which a case can be built. Armed with the image, the police went on full offensive to try and catch the killer. They managed to blow up the image to get something that was, uh, was a reasonable representation of Ireland. They didn't know what Ireland looked like at the time, but it was something that they could use in publicity to attract attention to the case, to circulate, crucially, amongst the gay community. Myself and uh, Ken John did a midnight press conference because we were concerned that people were being too relaxed about it. Uh, we, we gave a description of who we were looking for and to warn them that they had to be careful because the next one could be you. I think there was a general call out amongst the gay community to be very careful who you go home with tonight kind of thing. There was a great fear, there was great concern. With the police closing in, Colin Ireland decided there was no point in hiding and on the 19th of July, he went to see a solicitor. He decided that I'll, I'll go into the solicitor and he gave an affidavit. He said that, yes, I am the man in the video. Yes, I did go to Emmanuel Spiteri's address, but when I got to the front door, there was another man in the flat. I didn't want to see him, so uh, I went home. It was too late to get a train, so I slept in a nearby churchyard. Unbeknownst to Ireland, someone from the solicitor's office passed on his details to the police, who already had his fingerprints on file from previous offences. Eventually, we got Ireland's name, cross-matched it against the mark, and it was his. So that placed Colin Ireland in the crime scene. Uh, and although you can't date a fingerprint, it, it most certainly helped in, in the totality of the evidence. On the 20th of July, 1993, Colin Ireland was arrested. On the 22nd, he was charged with the murder of 33-year-old Andrew Collier. The following day, on the 23rd of July, he was charged with the murder of 41-year-old Emmanuel Spiteri. If Colin Ireland had not been caught when he was, he would have continued to kill relentlessly until he was eventually stopped. It is the classic element of any serial killer. They won't stop until someone stops them. And there was lots of work done. We had ID parades, we had voice ID parades, forensication and lots of other things. He never opened his mouth for three days.